Another quote is, The church has been preoccupied with the question, What happens to your soul after you die? That's a good question. One time in my life, I went through the valley of the shadow of death. And do you know what I was thinking about? My soul. Amen. Amen. If you've never been to the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But if you've ever been there, that's what you're going to be thinking about, is your soul. As if the reason for Jesus coming can be summed up, Jesus is trying to help get you more souls into heaven as opposed to hell after they die. He says, I just think a fair reading of the Gospels blows that out of the water. I don't think that the entire message and life of Jesus can be boiled down to that bottom line. There we go again. Oh, it can't? Well, here's what he said. What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his Thou fool, this night thy shall be required of thee. You don't think the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned about the souls of men? And here this man has the audacity to say that that's not really what his ministry was about. You know why he says that? He says that because there are those countless multitude out that multitude out there that 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 have this this foggy idea of some kind of a savior or a god, but they really don't know him. So, but as long as they're sincere in what they're doing, everything's okay. That's the idea. That's why that type of interpretation. The emergent church doesn't have a position on absolute truth. I'm sure it doesn't. Or on anything for that matter. <laughs> Do you show up at a dinner party with your neighbors and ask, what's this, dinner's, what's this dinner party's position on absolute truth? No, you don't, because it's a nonsensical question. Oh, it's not? Oh, it is? I think absolute truth is very important. Because you are absolutely going to an absolute place when you die. And it's not going to be, uh, it's, not, it's not relative. It's going to be absolute. When you get ready to die, folks, you're going one of two places. Do you know the greatest deception that Satan has given mankind? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's that spirit of invincibility that you've got in your breast right now tonight. You, you think about death in an intellectual manner. Oh, I know I'm going to die someday. But way off down through there. And I'll know all about it when the time comes and blah, blah, blah. You don't know it in an experiential manner. In plain words, you don't really, 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 really believe deep, deep down in your soul this could be the last day on planet Earth for you. Amen. Amen. That tonight before midnight, you'll draw your last breath. There's just something about it that gives me a big advantage over you because I live with that moment by moment. I've got a big advantage. I don't live for tomorrow, it's for right now. Because I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow morning, but I know where I'll be if I'm not here tomorrow morning. i got a big advantage over you. Your, your, your concept of death is intellectual. You assent to a fact, but it doesn't affect the way you live. That's why Christians, most Christians in America, live this laid-back, lackadaisical, uh, don't-care, cavalier attitude. Well, I'm... Once saved, always saved, and you know I'll be okay when it when it happens. I'm not worried about it, and blah 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 blah. That's an intellectual assent to a fact, but that never affects the way you live. Are you in that category tonight? I hope not, but you may be. You may be. You may be. You may be. This may be the last day on planet Earth. For you and for me, it may be. And before I lay my head on my bed tonight, I will be on my knees, bless the name, and I will make certain that there is nothing between me and God. I'll make certain of that by the grace of God, because I can't do anything about it, but I will plead that blood covenant and that mercy that I know is mine, and I will plead for him to cleanse me in the precious blood of Christ. And that's the what I'm counting in. That's what I'm counting in. That's what I'm counting. That's what I'm trusting in. 
I'm trusting in God's goodness and His mercy and His graciousness that He cannot lie. I'm trusting in the fact that if I will confess and plead that blood and ask Him to wash my sins away, sins that I'm not even conscious of, but to cleanse me in the precious blood of Christ and trust my life and my soul into His hands, I fully believe tonight that being a gracious, merciful God, He'll cleanse me and I'll be ready. Amen. Amen. My goal is to destroy Christianity, he says, as a world religion, be a recatalyst for the movement of Jesus Christ. Author of a new book said in a telephone interview, Some people are upset with me because it sounds like I'm anti-Christian. I think they might be right. He wants to reshape, rethink, repackage the movement of Jesus Christ. Have you ever lived in a more arrogant generation than this one? Really? Really? Folks, do you think the generation that just went before us was a bunch of dumb heads? Let me tell you something. Most of the books I read were written in the 16 and 1700s. If I have a hundred books, I might have one or two written a contemporary author. And I'm not saying all contemporary authors are bad. One or two may be. The vast majority, and I'm talking, about, I'm talking about theology, doctrine, stuff like that. The vast majority of what I read is written in the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s. Do you know why? They were smart men. Very, very smart men. I hear the babble that comes out from behind the pulpits today. This, this regurgitated babble that comes out to the people by these preachers. And all in the world it is is just a bunch of worm, warmed over, reshaped and recast uh, religious platitudes it pre prepared, prepared and presented in a positive fashion to make you feel good about yourself. That's all it is. That's all it is. Yet this arrogant crowd thinks they are so smart that they can repackage the Lord Jesus Christ and present him to this generation. Boy, there's something. Boy, did not God did not God pick them? You ought to get a book written by Heinrich Meyer or Bengel. Uh, what's his first? I can't. These are both German. One lived in the 1700s. The other lived in the early 1800s. You ought to get their commentaries and read what these men. Lightfoot is another one. Read what these men have to say about the scriptures, and let them take you into the Bible, and read the Word of God. And you know what you'll say to yourself, man, I never had my idea in my life that the Bible had that much to say. That it was that deep, that it was that powerful, because most of the TV slop you get is is positive confession, feel good about self, prosperity, money, 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 money. Don't you get sick of it? That's all you get. And this bunch has the arrogance. I mean, the arrogance to say we're going to change it all. And we're going to repackage Jesus Christ to the whole world. Now, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You are a tool in the hand of Satan, an ignoramus that doesn't have enough sense to come in out of the cold, that he's using to redefine Christianity and prepare this whole world for the Antichrist. When he shows up, you will be one of his mouthpieces and champions to get the job done because you are as ignorant of who the Lord Jesus Christ is than any dog barking on the street corner. You don't have a clue who you're talking about. Now, that's the truth. That's the truth. And your arrogance has blinded you to the truth. Who's the Son of God? He's the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what am I going to do? I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified. And I'm not going to try to change the meaning of who He is and redefine our faith. I'm not about to do that. It takes an ignorant fool 
to get up and think he is so smart that he can change everything just because he lives in a generation that's arrogant like that. Everything changes. Throw out everything that's old. All the old music, just throw it out. All the old stuff, throw it away. It's useless. But these books right here have songs in them that have power. They've got power. There's power in there. And I'm not about to throw out something that's got power like that. Written by men and women who love the Lord. And they love the Lord that I know. The Lord of the Bible. Well, let me read this for you. Some of the values of the emerging church are an emphasis on emotions global outlook, a rise in the use of arts, and a rise in mysticism and spirituality. There you go. There you go. They have a global perspective. The terminology is paradigm shift. That means to change completely from the old into the new. They have what's called contemplative spirituality. Here's a definition of it. A belief system that uses ancient mystical practices to induce altered states of consciousness and is often wrapped in Christian terminology, the premise of a contemplated spirituality is pantheistic, that means God is all, and panentheistic, God is in all. That is the spirituality of the vast majority of the mainline Protestant churches and the emergent church movement in America and in the world. They are as deeply rooted in the occult as you could possibly be. They quote mantras. A mantra is something that you quote over and over and over again. The popularity of Buddhist practice among Christians has grown substantially during the last two decades. So it has. It has grown enormously in the last two decades. And it's growing by leaps and by bounds. The purpose of the message tonight is to warn you. It's to warn you. It's to tell you that if some family member, you have a brother or sister, some, some family member that goes to a church and they start telling you about this great experience they're having, about this teacher that's been brought in, about this new way of seeing things, and they want to recruit you. That's the point. They want to recruit you into this new movement. Beware. 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 Be warned tonight. It is pure poison. It is pure poison. It will affect you in ways that you never imagined. I'm going to say some things tonight. Be very careful the way I say them come to a close. Because I see what's headed. I see what's coming. I, I, see, what's, I see what's coming down the pipe. Amen. Kundalini arousal. This kundalini spirit. This coiled serpent spirit. Now, first of all, I'd ask you a question tonight, dear Christian friend. Is there one place in the Word of God where a serpent is ever cast in a good light? Let the Bible be the judge. One time. One time. The only time a serpent is used to affect something that was, uh, that's, that, that's good is in the book of Numbers when the brazen serpent was lifted upon the pole. All right? But that is a picture of a curse because the Lord Jesus said as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that was a type of our Lord Jesus Christ so therefore in the Bible a serpent is cast in a negative light so why would a Christian want to have anything to do with a serpent especially as it relates to his faith I'm not talking about having a pet uh, uh, boa constrictor or anaconda in the house you know, you may be here today and you may not be here tomorrow. <laughs> we find the snake, we'll find you. Amen. They just killed one in Florida, by the way, a, uh, a, uh, a uh, my python, a python, what, a Burmese python. They killed a Burmese python in Florida, 18 feet, 8 inches long. The record was 17 feet, 7 inches up until just two or three weeks ago. They had laid the thing out on. They had about four or five men laying end to end. And there that thing lay as a female and had eggs in it. 
18 feet, 8 inches long. Now, you wouldn't want to meet up with that thing on a dark, dark night, would you? Serpents are in a bad, casting a bad light in the Word of God. Bad light. Here's some of the symptoms of kundalini arousal. Burning heat or ice cold currents moving up the spine. In most cases, reaching the head. Sometimes a feeling of air bubbles or snake movement up through the body up to the head. Sensitivity to sound, light, smell, and the proximity of other people. The reason for the sensitivity to the proximity of other people is because of the soul and the power of the soul. You get around a dead body, you feel no more than this. Standing next to this piece of wood, there's nothing in here. You get around a living human being, and the closer you draw to a living human being, you start feeling it. How many know what I'm talking about? You're feeling the soul. Uh, terminology that relates to sexual experiences prevail in this thing. It has become very sexual, sexual in nature. And this is where the power lies in it, because this is a generation that's thrown out all the mores, all of the fears, all of the conduct. This thing is very, very, very sexual in its orientation. Yeah. Mystic religious experiences, revelation, or cosmic glimpses. Sure. Parapsychological abilities, light phenomena in or outside the body, and persistent anxiety or anxiety attacks due to the lack of understanding of what's going on, insomnia, manic high spirits, or deep depression, energy loss, impaired concentration and memory, total isolation due to inability to communicate, inner experiences out, and on and on and on and on and on the list goes. All you have to do is get some of the classic commentaries, uh, research material written by men who uh, lived 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago in foreign land. Randy Pike is outstanding. Brother Pike has enormous experience in this. And let them tell you about demon experiences. And you'll, you'll begin to you'll be amazed at how this kundalini yoga, the experiences in kundalini yoga run parallel with the demon experiences of men like Randy Pike on the mission field, ministering, watching the power of demons as they work in human beings. The man knows what he's talking about, folks. And compare that with what's going on today in this, in this kundalini yoga movement in the churches, and you'll see the source of it. What's the source of it? The source of it is Satan. It's demonic. Kundalini yoga is demonic possession. That's all it is, pure and simple, pure and plain as it can be. If you want to open yourself up for demonic possession, sit down in the lotus position. Start quoting some mantra over and over and over again in your head. Empty yourself <clears throat> of the discerning spirit of the Holy Ghost. And of course, you can't if you're really born again. But empty your mind of everything and open yourself up for the spirit that comes to you. And you'll get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the first thing you know, you are completely demon-possessed. And then get ready. Because your life will become a living hell. And you will not be able to deal with it. The only one that can deal with demon possession. Is the one who came into this world. And made a show of them openly. The Lord Jesus Christ. Father in thy name we pray. I pray what I've said tonight has been a help. Lord, I don't know. I'm just a man. I have no idea if there's anybody in this house tonight who's near this, or this is this is this has been they've been they, they've been solicited into it. I don't know. But God help them tonight to take the truth of what I've said to be a warning, to be armed, to have the knowledge to arm them against this, to be prepared for the enemy when he comes. those who watched this over the internet if they saw it tonight I pray that they'd take heart because you told us plainly in your word what to expect you said in the last days perilous times should come and the first thing you said about those perilous times that men should be lovers of their own selves and Lord I've heard self love preach for the last 30 years by some of the biggest evangelists in this country in spite of what you said in the book of 2nd Timothy in the face of the scripture when you said plainly lovers of their own selves God we pray glorify yourself tonight in Jesus blessed sweet holy name I pray Amen <laughs>